Okay, so I think it's time, so we're going to begin. Hi. So let me start off, um, we're a little bit smaller today. I guess people are taking midterms and um, hopefully if you're not here, you wouldn't know, but um, I wouldn't know. You're watching it on videocast. I wanted to start by um, just asking if there were any questions from the lecture last week on resistance or any thoughts that you might have given uh, to the topic um, since we didn't really have any time for discussion, but perhaps you've had a week to think about some of the stories and people that I told you about last week, and maybe in the meantime uh, some questions have come about. So I wanted to give you a couple minutes just to pose any questions or anything that you wanted to say or ask about that. Yeah? Maybe. Okay. Well, if questions do come about, obviously, you know, feel free to ask them. So, um, the next two weeks we're shifting topic uh, to a certain extent to focus on two filmic representations of the Holocaust. Uh, today and Thursday, Schindler's List, and next Tuesday and Thursday, parts of Claude Lanzmann's film, uh, Shoah. I wanted to draw your attention to something really important on the syllabus, which is particular for next week in case you want to start uh, watching the film. So what you'll see is, for Shoah, if you were to watch all four of the tapes, it will take you about nine and a half hours. Um, I would applaud that effort. Um, if you have the fortitude, um, intellectual and emotional and whatnot, to get through it, that's great. However, I'm only asking you to watch two and a half hours. And those two and a half hours are spelled out very clearly on the syllabus. So like for tape one, they're obviously digitized, they're not tapes. But uh, for section one, you watch the first 35 minutes. Um, tape two, you watch you know, minute five until 43 and so forth. So do make sure you look at the syllabus before you start watching the film so you know exactly what parts to watch. I should also say that on the CCLE website, I have the whole film script posted so you can look at it um, and see exactly, because keep in mind the film is in maybe 10 different languages, uh, owing to the fact that many of the people being interviewed and talked to, you know, come from many different nationalities um, and backgrounds. And so the film script is all in English and gives you the translations uh, the film also has subtitles with the translations, but it's sometimes easier to follow along if you have the film script sitting there in front of you. Um, so that's for next week. Thursday, the following Thursday, that is a, a week from this Thursday, there's a fourth response paper. I'll have that up uh, by the afternoon today. And um, the topic will be obviously about the two films. Uh, so you should be, if you haven't watched the films, you should be in terms of preparation, simply watch them and um, that'll be due uh, the Thursday, the 23rd. All right? Um, so, yeah, Schindler's List um, is the topic for today. And um, I always wonder how to give a lecture on Schindler's List because it's such a, um, I mean, not just an emotionally heavy film, it's such a fraught film in so many ways. And I mean that um, because of its tremendous commercial success, um, it's international reputation. Uh, it's probably one of the only films that if I ask people, you know, anyone on the street, like, what film have you seen about the Holocaust? People have seen Schindler's List and, uh, and generally, you know, have a very complex relationship to the film uh, in terms of their own kind of identification. Um, and, and I often, you know, I've gone through various phases about the film where sometimes I truly love the film for so many of the techniques and storytelling that Spielberg has been able to bring together. And other times I think I've sometimes had more critical distance to the film. And so the lecture that I give varies over the years um, about how I, how I talk about this film. 
So we're going to look at it as a film now. And this is, I think, uh, a really important aspect of the class. Remember, the class is called the Holocaust in Film and Literature, which means that we're talking about the representation of historical events in particular media. And in this case, the medium is the medium of film. And in order to do that, we also have to have a language to talk about film in a way that is analytical. And so part of what I'm going to do today is just begin by introducing a number of film uh, concepts to you that then we'll use in our analysis of the film to understand its effects and its successes. All right, so let me uh, just go here and I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of these. Uh, oh gosh, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, we're way back. Let's see where we are. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, that's good enough. From current slide. Yeah. We're going to start here. And uh, there's only two slides in the, in the PowerPoint for today. And then I'm going to really focus on close reading of, of the film. But I wanted to just introduce a number of terms to begin with uh, that you'll hear me use or that perhaps you've used yourself, but maybe not in, been exactly sure of their definition. In your response paper for next week, I'm going to ask you to, to look at a number of, uh, to pick out a number of scenes that you do a close analysis of. So these terms will come in you know, particularly handy. So film is obviously a visual medium. And so looking at the framing elements, so looking at what's in the frame, really what's on the screen, is an, act is an absolutely important part of the film. And so it's kind of like the way one would deal with a work of art. One needs to look at it as a visual, uh, in its visual modes. So with regard to film, the visual elements, one begins by talking about the shots. And the shots refer to those shots produced by the director, how they're framed, and uh, how they're arranged in certain sequences. And when they're arranged in certain sequences, the director is making decisions as to what linearly should follow upon each thing. And this is very important because in telling a story, one's making decisions of what we call implotment. That is to say, what comes after the next thing, right? And a film plays from start to finish, so it tells a story. And Schindler's List is certainly a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So these different kinds of shots do have different effects in a film. Some shots, what we call an establishing shot, tend to set a scene. So an establishing shot tends to be kind of drawn back. It may say, if you were to take a shot at UCLA, maybe you would start you know, in the quad and you'd show the entire quad before you zoom in to a particular person and focus on his or her story. This film, you know, Schindler's List, does much of this. Schindler's List, even the title, of course, tells us that it's going to be about a person, Schindler, and the fact that he has a list that will learn how it was created. But we also know it's also about something much more than just that. It's not just a close-up on a single person. It's also about a broader event, the Holocaust, right? And so we have to have these kind of establishing shots that give us a sense of the breadth that may be, you know, Krakow, it may be uh, the camp, uh, the concentration camp. It may be you know, the Jewish people as a whole. But in any case, these establishing shots give us a sense of scale. That's the important thing. It gives us a sense of scale and perspective. So I would say establishing shots and close-ups are kind of like, like macro and micro. Uh, micro history, macro history. Focusing on Schindler himself, focusing on the event of the Holocaust. Now, much of the dialogue in Schindler's List is also about interactions with characters, right? It's particularly between Schindler and Stern, German and Jewish. It's between Schindler and Goethe, you know, good guy, bad guy. Uh, both Nazis, but also obviously very different perspectives. Shot and reverse shot. Looking at someone talking, looking at us hearing the person listening, going back and forth between people. Shots and reverse shots are always ways of associating, making dialogue. Now, much of what happens in Schindler's List is also about action. Because a number of, not only is it about you know, dialogue, not only is it about you know, where things took place, it's also about events. And events have motion, right? Events have time. So the evacuation of the ghetto, which will be an, an event that I'll be talking about extensively today, 
is one where the camera is moving. It's following people, it's tracking people. The camera may be you know, actually on someone because he actually used handheld cameras, um, not exclusively, but predominantly in the film. And so one gets a sense of the camera jarring, moving as it's being carried. Um, one also sees the um, tracking shots where the camera is also panning or moving to show you um, change, motion, dynamic uh, movement, things like that. So these are all examples of different kinds of shots that are used in the film, and they all have, they all have different effects. Now, I don't know why it's crinkling. I so I can move this a little bit, because I think it's annoying. <laughs> All right. Now, scenes are composed of shots that are spliced together. So a scene you know, can be of varying length. It could be you know, just a minute long. It can be 15 minute long. Uh, the evacuation of the ghetto, for example, runs almost 15 minutes in the film. So it's interesting how film time, you know, 15 minutes, and when think about like a historical event of the evacuation of the ghetto, which took um, more than a day, you know, you can condense all of the, the, the event history into 15 minutes of very frenetic uh, film activity. So by splicing together a sequence of shots. Now, the film will also use certain kind of montage techniques and you can have montage in different ways. You can have montage meaning a kind of bleeding of different scenes into one another within the frame. So like, for example, you have something in the background coming into the foreground, creating a kind of blurred effect. But you also have something called temporal montage, where you splice together things that may not be chronologically sequential. And the film is really brilliant for doing this. A number of times, what Spielberg often will do in telling a story is not just move linearly, but he'll also kind of back up and move forward at different times. And so you'll have, and I'll, I'll show you an example of this you know, later today, you'll have examples of kind of talking about something that's about to happen before it happens, but also referencing things that came way before, all in the same scene. And that's called a temporal montage, because it takes something that's past and something that's future and puts it all together in the same scene. So, as if they were simultaneous. Now, of course, other things that you've probably noticed or maybe used to like analyzing would be things like motifs or symbols that are introduced and kind of maintain themselves throughout the story. Um, as examples, you know, this story begins with candles and the theme of fire is introduced throughout, the, the closeness on hands, people's hands in terms of what they're doing is introduced throughout, smoke, uh, things like this. And these symbols, of course, kind of maintain themselves throughout the film. And sometimes they're even highlighted, you know, in, in the case of the, the girl in, in red, the, the, the very famous child that Schindler identifies with at uh, numerous points in the story, she becomes an important motif uh, that represents probably all children, right? It's not just this one child, but it's also innocence. It's children as a whole. And, uh, and, and the fact that she then, you know, towards the end of the film dies or is shown dead is also part of the struggle that Schindler himself uh, has to deal with in his own kind of ethical orientation and in his decision to make the list, the Schindler's list. So framing elements, um, we need to look at always, I think it's very important to understand how a story is framed. And I mean framing not just you know, in a scene, but also mean the story as a whole. Where does it begin? Where does it end? What happens in the middle? And my analysis today will actually begin with the beginning and the end to talk about this, this framing. Now, this is, Schindler's list is presented as a story. And this is really important it didn't take place as a story, um, but it was put into a story form through the medium of film. So all the events that happened around it, many, many events, um, simultaneous events, uh, things that uh, you know, one has to pick and choose uh, what one's gonna tell in order to put it together in a linear narrative. And of course Spielberg does this in a, in a really you know, masterful way. The effect is, it produces an effect of what we might call a reality effect. And it say it gives us a sense of, whoa, we're witnesses to history. We're watching this happen, almost unfolding before our eyes. And one has to understand, it's like, how does that happen? How does this reality effect generated through the medium of film? And we'll come back to that. Finally, a couple other things I'll move quickly here. 
identification, you know, if you think of identification means our as viewers associations or identification with certain characters. We identify perhaps with uh, Schindler as, as, a, as a person who change, changes over time, that he, he confronts an ethical decision moment in his life uh, to do something, to actively save people that are obviously in danger. We may be identified with the victims, uh, people who are suffering, uh, and the horror at watching them uh, be you know, violated, abused, and killed. Um, in many ways, I would say we kind of like anti-identify with Goethe for his sadistic behavior, his, his, uh, his, his, you know, his violence, his, his excesses, his lack of caring, right? And in many ways, we see the same kind of thing in the Von Say conference film, where it was very hard to identify with the characters that we saw, these Nazis who really had no redeeming qualities. Uh, in order for us to identify as viewers with the characters in the film, we have to have some kind of, we have to have a shared kind of value system. We have to have something that in common and in many ways, you know, we could say that we have something in common, perhaps with Schindler, in that he, you know, evolves as a character. He not only changes his mind, but he makes an active decision to, as we saw in the film, you know, save people. So this process, this identification, happens, you know, on intellectual, emotional levels. Um, the gaze, we'll look a little bit about this too, it's kind of like where the characters are looking in the film, and often we're looking at the characters looking, which means that we're given a kind of privileged position, like what are they looking at? And this is very important, you know, when Schindler is watching the girl in the, in the red, where she's moving through the ghetto, you know, hiding and so forth, he's watching her and we're watching him watch her, right? That process is sort of like, um, you know, engages us in, in our understanding of the film. Sound. Uh, sound is absolutely critical in this film. And two kind of technical terms I just want to introduce real quick, diegetic sound and non-diegetic sound. Diegetic sound is when I see on the screen what's happening and the sounds are coming from within that scene. It's like people talking and I see them talking. As opposed to something happening like the little girl in red, you know, moving through and me hearing children's choir singing. That's non-diegetic sound, because it's not coming from within the scene. There's no children singing at that moment. And so one of the things that Spielberg does in a really brilliant way is, again, utilize sound for certain effects. And these, those effects produce, I would say, affect, which is an emotional connection uh, with what we're seeing. OK, so those are the terms we're going to use today. And then the last thing I'm going to say is sort of just us to keep in mind this one important point, which is a film as narrative. And I mean narrative in the sense of a story. Um, so again, we're talking about the representation of historical events, utilizing narrative forms, visual forms, and auditory elements that come together to produce a story. So events, I mean like the actual happenings. Like by that, I mean the events that people, um, the actions people took, and the decisions they made in the 1930s and 1940s, those are the events. The film is a representation of those events in a story form that has a clear beginning and a middle and an end, who has characters that develop and change, that moves both diachronically, which means chronologically through time, but also synchronically, meaning showing simultaneous things that are happening. Because it's not just one story, it's lots of different things happening at the same time. I'd say the film is also didactic in the sense that it's meant to instruct. It's meant to teach. The subtitles that tell us, you know, the evacuation of the ghetto in 1943. Those subtitles give us cues as listeners, as viewers, as to what's going on. And I'd say it also produces um, a kind of a cathartic emotional response in that we go through a journey in some ways with uh, Schindler and with Stern and with all the Jews who survive and the perpetrators who, you know, who act in, you know, vicious ways, it's a drama, you know, it's a kind of melodrama in this sense in that we see suffering, uh, we see tragedy, um, it's marked by realism, and, and yet in the end we've ex had this experience. Um, Finally, I should say just a couple other just like little things about it. You know, the film also has other elements of like, you know, kind of an individual, Schindler, making decisions, changing, you know, engaging, 
versus a kind of system, right? The Nazi system, the Holocaust, you know, the war. Um, for the most part, perpetrators and victims are clearly delineated, but there's one crucial character, and it's obviously Schindler, who kind of moves in between. And that's why he's such an interesting character, because of this kind of blurry gray space that he operates within. And in many ways, that gray space is the very basis for the entire film. Okay, so there's a bunch of like introductory things. I hope you've actually seen the film, so that what some of the things I'm saying here actually make sense. But let's start by talking and looking at, at framing devices. And perhaps um, the one that's the most obvious is this uh, device here of starting in color, starting with the lighting of candles, and starting in a very, um, very enclosed domestic space. And the sound is, there's not much yet. So even if I stop right here, I mean, a lot is already happening setting this scene, right? You're starting in a domestic space. You're starting at a, at a um, probably a Shabbos service. You're having a blessing over the wine. You're lighting the candles. You have a Jewish family in a small, enclosed domestic space in color. They disappear at one moment uh, at this point. The candle burns down. You have this sense of time uh, marching on. And then, of course, if you remember this scene, the candle turns into the smoke of a train uh, in a second. And so, so much is prefigured in this initial scene, right? I'll just let it continue to play. So all this takes us into the film. I mean, this is essentially, again, a, a critical framing device, right? A critical framing device of the destruction of a Jewish community, uh, set in color, juxtaposed with black and white. The Shabbat candles disappear into the smoke of a, of a, of a train. We already associate trains with the Holocaust, with deportations. Um, we already have a kind of uncertainty as to what's going to happen. The family has obviously disappeared from the scene here. And we've gone also from color to black and white. And all this has an effect uh, for us. In going from color to black and white, which is the film is primarily in black and white, we also have this sense of it's like a documentary. Right? It's like we're going, to, uh, we're going to some kind of historical document. We're going back in time. And in many ways, the fact that the decision to film in black and white achieves this sense of a creating access to a reality that's now past but that we need to know, right? And so almost the entire film will proceed with the exception of the little girl in red and one other element of candles coming back in will go all in black and white until we get to the very end with the liberation of the Schindler Jews um, from the camp and this march uh, where they begin to wonder where do we do now? Where do, where do we go? So there's our beginning, and let's take our other framing element. Let's go all the way to the end and kind of look at the return to color, which knowing what we know is also an extraordinarily emotional moment in the film. One, you know, there are many emotional moments, and you think you're done by the time you get to the end, and then something else happens which takes us overboard, I'd say. Um, and that is the reunion, you know, of the Schindler Jews themselves with the actors and actresses who play them. So let's just zip all the way to the end, because I want to show you, uh, show you that. So, yeah, right around here. So this is a Russian officer who ostensibly you know, has liberated them. Many Jews had survived. He asked, where do we go? Um, 
Oops, I may actually start a tiny bit earlier because I think it's actually interesting. Like they, this is the sense of loss, right? We could use some food. Is it simultaneous with the Jews marching you know, out? You know, of course not. Again, thinking about the, the splicing together of the different scenes here, right? So there you have the Jews being liberated. You have the music, which is celebrating a return to Jerusalem. And you have the hanging of Amon Gert at the end, which is the carrying out of justice that happened uh, after the war. And then you have the return, the, uni the, the unity of um, the survivors and the people that played them. And in between, we learned something about also what happened in the future to Oscar Schindler himself, his um, enamel factory, his recognition by Yad Vashem as a righteous person. So color returns. And so it turns out you weren't watching the actors and actresses, but you were watching the actual survivors, right? And what could be whoa, like what more emotional, right? At the end, extraordinary. And so now we end up at his grave, which is actually in Jerusalem at the end. And then the series, this relatively long scene where if you were still watching the film at this point, where most, you know, you were just like, you're just crying because you're just like, my gosh, this is extraordinary. And it is, right? And I'm not meaning to in any way, you know, belittle that. I think it's extraordinary. You have this recognition of the representation and the reality coming together in the present which in this case is at the grave of the very person that whose story is being told, right? So this is a really interesting film in this regard because it begins to play with genre in some interesting ways. Like what we thought was just you know, a representation or just a film also makes a point of saying that it's also deeply connected with the reality and I'm going to connect this reality for you at the very end so that after you've gone through this entire you know, historical journey, you end up in the present uh, with the survivors themselves, right? And so this is, you know, this I'd say is, is how we have to begin to understand the film as, uh, as again, you know, beginning to play with, uh, play with genre and also its, 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 its claim on historical reality, which I think is very strong. Thoughts or questions, you know, just about uh, the, the end here, I wonder, how other people, or how you kind of read the end. Um, what's the significance of having, like, did we have to have the survivors and the, and the actors and actresses come together at the grave of Schindler? Like, what the, what the effect is? Or why? What do you think? Um, I think it makes that final sense of, like, the happening. Mm -hmm. And you should take it seriously. You should feel like, like it was a real All so like if there was ever any question as to whether this actually happened, at the very end, uh, you not only go to the grave of Schindler himself, but all the people who are presented in the film are also, who are still alive, are also there, reunited in a sense between the actors who played them and the, and the actual historical figures. So in many ways, it combats this possibility of denial or questioning, right, in, this, in the film itself. Yeah, it's a really, I think that's an important observation. Does it have any other effect, would you say? Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, I think the, your idea of it kind of the change the black, the color at the end is, has a kind of optimism, it has a kind of futurity, it has a kind of possibility that everything is not lost. Right? And I think that this is also an important part. If you didn't have this last part in the film and it ended only maybe at that liberation, you know, you would be, you would certainly have a sense of, okay, there's a certain finality to this, but what happened next, right? And so in many ways, this film also gives you the next 50 or so years, uh, which is that um, the survivors survived, they had children, uh, that is to say that uh, there is a future. And it kind of takes us out of the past and brings us into the present. And in that regard, I think this is also one of the reasons the film is so successful because it can connect across time and space with other people. 
That's why it's generationally so successful. That's why a, you know, a high school student can watch the film who's temporally, spatially, geographically, linguistically, religiously removed, but can identify with it because it takes us into the present. It's not just a historical document. And therefore, the messages that the film is trying to indicate, I think the messages that have to do deeply with ethics, are relevant today. And I think all that's achieved in this last moment. Um, this idea of respect, this idea of honor, this idea of someone who made a moral decision and suffered for it, and the fact is that all these things still apply to the world today. If you didn't have these last scenes, I think all that would be missing. Or certainly not as strong. So that's interesting, and we've only looked at the, the framing at this point, but a lot's happening. And I mean, th this is also one of the reasons why the film is so successful. You know, if one was to like look at even you know, in terms of box office, you know, successes worldwide, uh, highest grossing, you know, Holocaust film of all time, and the fact that it's been won so many awards, it's so widely recognized, and a lot of it has to do with why is the film so successful as a film, and these are some of the reasons already that we've already begun to look at. Okay, so let's talk about. I'm going to go to another scene actually um, to talk about, you know, framing elements again. And it's right around, it's a critical moment in the film where the decision to produce a list uh, is actually made. Um, actually, I'm going to show you something else real quick. <laughs> I'll go back to that scene with the candle because one of the things that I had forgotten, if I let it play a little bit longer, is that you get the beginnings of a list at the very beginnings of the film. If you remember, There's more than one list. What is this list? Do you remember? It's the very beginning of the film. What is this list of? Anyone know? Remember? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So who's producing this list? The Nazis. Exactly. The Nazis are producing a list. This is not Schindler's list here. This is a list. Now, the Nazis kept great records of everything. They, uh, they kept records of they, all the census data, all the Jews that live in the ghetto, all of the belongings that they had, their addresses, even to the point of like literally every chair, piece of furniture, jewelry, everything. So all this is all in the archives now, because we have it. So there's evidence that the Nazis collected a lot of data. Uh, this is the production of data by the Nazis. The Nazis are taking names. These are all the Jews. And ideal, I mean, what's happening here is a kind of systematic collection of names of people who are going to be put into a ghetto. It's the very first stages of the Holocaust, which is bring them all together, get their names, type them up into lists, deport them into ghettos. And again, you know, I think, you know, filmically what's going on here, and this is really interesting too, the sound of the typewriter, the focus on the individual letters, the idea that you see the production of a list. And we know that the Nazis now are using this list, you know, for purposes that are, you know, less than, I mean, they're, they're certainly very different than the ones that Schindler is going to use. So they're not a list to save people. This is a list to exterminate people. So at the very beginning, we're given this idea of creating lists, of numbers, of registries, of names. And it's not until two hours later do we actually see Schindler's List being produced. And this is in film time. This is really interesting. So you're, I'm here. You know, I'm in minute like three of the film right now. I need to go to minute two hours and 15 minutes before I actually see Schindler's List being made. But yet I know something about the process. I know something about the deportation process, the rounding up process, the evacuation of the ghetto, all these things that we know about the kind of unfolding of the events of the Holocaust. And in some ways, deferring the production of Schindler's List until this moment in the film is amazing. And if you remember this moment in the film, this is also just after the most horrific, difficult scenes of the film. So there's very few scenes of you know, showing kind of mass death and burning of bodies. But this happens in the film right at this moment. Um, and it's a horrible moment in the film, also where we find out um, the fate of the little girl in red. Again, it's a deferred moment. 
because she's introduced, you know, almost an hour and a half earlier. So somewhere around minute 50 or so when the ghetto is evacuated, that's when we meet the little girl in red. It's not until minute two hour and 15 minutes do we see like what happened to her. We see her fate. It's never said, it's only seen. We see a little red um, kind of splotch on a, on, a, on a pile of bodies. And it's at that moment that you have this very interesting conversation that Schindler himself has with Stern about the decision and that Schindler has with Goethe about the decision. And those two moments are framed in a very significant way in the film because they show this interaction between these two characters, the, between the, you know, Schindler and the Jewish uh, victim and Schindler and the Nazi perpetrator. And again, Schindler operates between these two. And that's what makes him such an interesting character uh, for us. So how does Spielberg present this filmically? I'll let you, I want to show you. So these are, you know, there, there she is. One of the few times the color comes back. So we're, again, you know, thinking about the gaze. We see the little girl first. We find out her fate. We find out she didn't make it. And then we see Schindler watching her as well, right? The horror of not only the smell of what you're seeing of, you know, bodies being burned, but also the horror of learning the fate of this, of this little girl. And this moment then that becomes a critical kind of defining moment that gives rise to this other list. Right? The list doesn't come until after the scene. So the first conversation happens between Schindler and Jewish victim, between Stern. The decision of you know, what to do, the struggle here. So again, shot, reverse shot, shot, reverse shot, going back and forth between them. So, see what I'm saying? It's on Schindler, it's on Stern, it's on Schindler, it's on Stern. It goes back and forth in a very closed space, right? So this, this scene is very tightly wound together. It's emotionally very heavy. The men are talking to each other. They're, you know, obviously he's visibly upset. Stern doesn't know what his future is going to be. Schindler focuses on the face, uh, goes back and forth in this, you know, darkened room and goes back and forth between their conversation. So again, you know, we've moved from these kind of like larger outside expansive spaces to very tightly focused on the characters themselves and, and their decision making process and ethics and orientations and, and hopes. Again, shot, reverse shot. So the next scene that follows up on this is now Schindler talking with uh, Gert himself. So I'm going to play, I'm going to show you that. I want to talk a little bit about this. I mean, the camera is inside the house looking outward. Uh, you have Schindler and Gert uh, walking essentially on a, on a balcony outside. The, you know, you can see the camp outside. And each time the window here is kind of a framing device uh, as they try to come together in terms of understanding a deal, essentially a bribe that Schindler offers to Gert uh, for, you know, for allowing the Jews to survive. 
But in terms of the film technique, what's going on here is you see two kind of divided consciousness, uh, a kind of divided consciousness. You know, you have Goethe's worldview, you have Schindler's worldview, and this possibility of coming together by this uh, almost coming together, notice, noticing that they're fundamentally separate from one another. And you see this visually, this visual separation in the scene. So, I mean, this is what I mean. So it's, uh, you know, the, the idea of you have separation, you have an attempt to kind of come to some kind of, uh, you know, solution. Um, but completely different worldviews clashing. So this scene, extraordinary, not only because of the question being asked at the end, what's a person worth to you, which you already should remember that original scene at the beginning, you know, what's a, what's a Jew worth in terms of the typing for the Nazis? At that moment, they're worth slave labor. Uh, they're worth perhaps even less than that and that they're going to be deported and exterminated. Here, for Schindler, they're worth something in that they're worth not just their labor, but they have human dignity, right? They have human worth, an inherent worth uh, for Schindler. For Gert, they have nothing. They're, 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 they're they can be exterminated. And yet, once this question, which is never asked, never answered, what's a human being worth to you, the very next scene that comes is the typewriter. And so now we get the list, and you have the beginning of the production of, of the thousand or so Schindler Jews that, that are saved. He dictates the list, Stern types it up, the camera moves, you know, focusing on this uh, scene of them talking to each other and then close-ups on the letters. And I don't think it's, uh, again, I don't want to over-interpret the significance of this, but, but the focusing on the names, the letters, the actual production of this list as a typewritten document, and the fact that, that Spielberg will present this kind of, um, this, he'll show us the medium in which it's being produced. You know, the word obliterate literally means to take away the letter. That's what obliterate means. And if you think about obliteration of a group of people, obliteration is the destruction of a group of people. In many ways, this is the returning uh, of a, this is about survivorship. This is about surviving. It's about returning the letter, which is also returning the name. It's about inscribing those names for a future. And I'd say that in many ways, that scene where at the end where they place the rocks on Schindler's grave, this is also about a future. It's about inscribing names for a future. That someone will remember who Oscar Schindler is. That someone will remember who, um, you know, every one of these people, you know, who they were. So if you looked, I mean, on some of the links that I gave you, I mean, this is again, the, the, the film is, it doesn't take uh, a tremendous number of liberties with what we know of the historical record. We know the names of all the uh, Schindler Jews. We know their, uh, quite a bit about them. We know their religion, the fact that uh, they were Jewish. Uh, we know their nationality. We know um, their prison numbers. Uh, we know what their occupation was. We know their dates of birth. All this exists, and so this is just some of the, so in German, you generally write the day first then the month here, and that's the year. So it gives the names of all these Jews, this is the link that I gave you, who were saved. Essentially, this list, which is quite long, um, amounts to about 1,100 actual people who were placed on a list by Oscar Schindler and, and saved. 
And they, you know, the things that they did, they were mainly like artisans, they were cooks, they were, I'm going to just read you some of the, the work, the things that they did. You know, person who built walls, worked in industry, was a metal worker, um, metal worker, wall builder, house builder, table maker, electrician, you know, office worker, you know, pretty much uh, like everyday, you know, worker, working class uh, folks. Almost all Polish, a few of other uh, nationalities, uh, Russian, uh, Dutch, Hungarian, uh, Slavic, but the vast majority uh, Polish. So this scene uh, already establishes, as I mentioned before, a kind of a, a kind of a, a character study. And in many ways, thinking about a character study, and this is something I think the film achieves in an extraordinary way, is one looks at it as a journey. It's a kind of an evolution of a character. And if anyone undergoes you know, that evolution, it's really Schindler, you know, Schindler himself. Goethe is kind of presented, and I think historically accurate, as, as a really I mean, sadistic a figure that doesn't change, that, that consistently perpetrates violence, that does so in a arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary way. He'll, um, he certainly is power hungry, certainly is uh, sadistic in every uh, regard, has no redeeming features. And again, in terms of identification, you know, we don't, we as viewers, you know, would find it very difficult to identify with someone like him. Uh, it's a kind of disidentification. And yet with Schindler, we understand he has some faults, you know, as a womanizer. He's a member of the SS, uh, of the Nazi party. He's someone that, you know, was obviously out to make money. He has his own interests, you know, at, at the forefront, certainly at the beginning of the film. But later he changes. And as he has other people's interests, and as we know from historical sources, he risked and lost much uh, in the course of the war. We have hope for Gertz, yeah. The, hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah, there's like two moments in the film, I guess, where exactly, like, where Gertz sort of has these kind of moments of, you know, you might say humanity or human decency. Um, one is in the difficult relationship he has, you know, with, uh, with Helen, and the other is uh, at those moments where some people are pardoned uh, at the end. But, you know, prior to that, what we see is, you know, the arbitrary execution of people for no reason whatsoever, the kind of the, the lying, the deception, and, and, um, and from survivor testimonies that we have, you know, every survivor testifies to his, his, his bestiality. Uh, and brutalness. Uh, so I think the depiction is, is quite uh, accurate based on the sources that we have. Are there questions on that? So I want to look at actually Gert for a moment and actually talk about Gert with regard to a really interesting film sequence in here that gives rise to the uh, evacuation of the ghetto. And um, this is shortly after they execute the uh, four, men, uh, four women, uh, who is the engineer, um, so arbitrarily executed, and then they proceed to follow the advice that she gave. And the scene is, is here. And in many ways, I'll, I'll start with the, the scene of catastrophe, of death. What's interesting about this scene, and this is where Gert gives a, a speech about the, um, the evacuation of the ghetto, it's essentially an auditory event that frames the entire scene, which is his speech. He's giving a speech that basically is going to say that he's going to look back in history. Over 600 years, you've had Jewish life in Krakow. That history is now gone. He's giving a sense of the future to come, which is the evacuation of the ghetto, which follows on the scene that comes next. And then you also hear him talking, but what he's saying doesn't always accord with what you're seeing. And this is really interesting because this again goes back to the film techniques that Spielberg uses to convey the, the sheer breadth uh, of, of the event itself. So you'll see it on a very personal level. You'll see Schindler shaving. You'll see Gert shaving. You'll hear the speech already happening, which is giving you a sense of something to come in the future, and yet it hasn't happened yet. You'll see um, 
the registration uh, tables being put out. Again, something that'll happen only after uh, this, this takes place. And then you'll hear, um, you'll, you'll hear the speech conclude and then turn to the event that it's meant to uh, unleash, which is the evacuation of the ghetto. So in terms of film technique, a lot of interesting stuff is going on in terms of thinking about what's simultaneous, what's chronological, what's happening at the auditory level, what's happening at a visual level, and how these two kind of worldviews, that of Schindler and Gert, kind of come clashing in some ways together right before the evacuation of the ghetto. So I'm going to play this scene, and I might uh, play it more than once so you can sort of see the, the techniques that are being used, um, the decision moments that Spielberg used to convey this part. So here you have the two characters, right? So you don't have any, you don't have any voiceover, or any auditory at this, at this exact second. But you see uh, something that they're both doing ostensibly simultaneously. They're getting ready for their day, right? They're shaving. Uh, you have the two kind of protagonists uh, being brought together. They're obviously unaware, perhaps, that each other is shaving at this moment. But in the scene, we're like meant, to, we're meant to see them together. That is, they're starting their days, different views. Um, and then his speech begins but he's still shaving. Like, does, does, this is a non-diegetic moment in the film, right? Does, does Schindler actually hear him giving the speech while he's shaving? No, I mean, of course not. But the effect is that it's already giving us a sense of a future to come, right? It's setting up a dichotomy between these two characters. It's utilizing, I mean, Spielberg could have waited to have put that sound when we see what we're actually, it's being referred to. But he doesn't. He actually uses sound as a kind of almost anticipatory framing device. Now you might think, oh, I'm over-interpreting here, but believe me, this is extremely well-organized uh, piece of film that's scripted to create certain effects. And so to put the voice of Amon Gert together with Schindler at this moment is also to create this uh, dissonance effect of two different worlds colliding. So today is history, says Gert. Schindler's looking. Gert shaving. So ostensibly this is later in the day. Schindler's not there. Uh, Gert is now giving his speech uh, to all, all the officers who are going to participate in the evacuation of the ghetto. And he cites you know, the long history. So this is extraordinary now. So we've gone from being outside, listening to the speech, to a Jew who is obviously in a domestic space who's praying. And yet the speech is still going on, right? So again, we're moving simultaneously now, right? I mentioned earlier that sometimes the film moves linearly in terms of chronology. Diachronic time is chronological time. But it also has these moments of synchronic time, which is what's happening at the same time that Gert's giving a speech. Well, maybe Schindler's shaving. Maybe there's a Jew in his home praying, right? And so we now have this second soundtrack. We have this visual element that uh, is completely, you know, it's obviously we can draw the connection. We understand that Gert is talking about Jews like this who are about to be evacuated, but the film, the visual takes us inside this other space. And yet the soundtrack stays the same, right? We're still hearing Gert but overlaid uh, with a, a Jewish man praying. We see another scene. Eating, sleeping, these are kind of scenes of tenderness, uh, obviously, here. And again, you know, think of the viciousness of the speech itself, which is basically extermination of a people. And we see you know, these extremely tender scenes of families together, the last time they're eating, sleeping. And then the anxiety of having to take their valuables, 
their jewelry, swallow it, right? Because the only way they can smuggle it out. So we're seeing what's going on in the homes ostensibly at the same time that this speech is taking place or around the same time, right? The kind of preparations that the victims are making and the kind of worldview of the, of the perpetrators. So not, again, these things aren't seen as kind of like one comes after the other, but they're simultaneous. And so it's interesting, how do you convey simultaneity in a linear medium? This is how he does it, through a kind of temporal montage. Right, so this is simultaneous. All these things that are happening simultaneous in a linear form. So here now we're at Isaac Stern, right? All these things, you know, so all these different things are happening simultaneous. The setting up of the tables uh, to... Yeah, so what does it mean, you know, to hear Goethe's speech and see Stern? Again, this, I mean, yes, it's non-diegetic. That is to say, it's not Stern speaking. We don't need to see Goethe speaking. The soundtrack is enough to give us a sense of terror, of impending doom, of this sense of destruction that's about to come. And because of the simultaneity of all these different scenes, we also get a sense of the scope and scale, right? All conveyed in this, really, this kind of acoustic moment, which is just a speech. If Spielberg just had us listen to the speech, it would only be the perspective of the perpetrators. But because he shows us all these victims simultaneously with the acoustic event, you then begin to appreciate the complex interplay of the event itself, that it had many perspectives and many different participants and many different agents. So, and then to wrap it up, he starts and ends in the same place. Today is history, right? Today is history, shaving, looking at all the victims, gives a speech, see the setting up of the destruction, ends with today is history. And this becomes a decisive moment uh, for the destruction of the ghetto. Thoughts or kind of reactions or uh, any questions? Good. So then we're going to continue. I'm going to kind of look at this scene and we'll continue this probably um, next time and I'll talk a little bit more broadly about some of the film techniques and the, and the ways that they're deployed in the film. But this is also a really interesting moment in the film. Again, when you think about the connection between scenes. And so this is a new scene. Obviously, we're not talking about uh, Gert giving a speech. We're not talking about, um, you know, the impending destruction of the... Of the uh, Jewish community in the ghetto, we're looking at our protagonist looking at what's happening. And this is critical because it goes back to that question of the gaze. We as viewers begin to identify with Schindler because we identify with what he's seeing. He's a spectator on the events themselves at this point. And this is extraordinary because we're a spectator on those events too. As a historical film, and so far I put that in quotes because it kind of makes us, you know, it goes back in time, it's black and white. We're a spectator, essentially, to these events. But we're also implicated in some interesting ways, especially when we come up to the present, because it has to do a lot with what do we remember, what do we carry forward, what do we learn, how do we change, and in many ways, it's exactly the same questions that Schindler's dealing with as a spectator. He just happens to be presented as if he's there looking at an event unfold. I don't know if he was actually there. I suspect he wasn't. I suspect he didn't see this. However, in the film, we see as if he saw this from a hilltop. So didactic moment, liquidation of the ghetto, March 13th, 1943. We as viewers are given that information. 
And this is a really, I mean, this scene, if I was to ask you, you know, to watch another scene like in its entirety, I would watch the 15 minutes of the evacuation of the ghetto because it's, uh, it's extraordinary in a lot of ways because how do you reenact the evacuation of a ghetto? Uh, I mean, it is like, think of like, like the challenge of what would be involved in taking an event which obviously involved thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, you know, perpetrators, Nazis, victims, children, old people, young people, um, herding them off, you know, to an uncertain fate. How do you present kind of the emotional impact, the, the psychological impact, the physical impact, the violence, um, the, the duration? Like, how do you capture all that in film? And in many ways, these 15 minutes, you know, condense all of that, all that history, all those emotions, all that, all that into, you know, this, this one filmic moment. And it begins, as you can see, kind of on the ground with the moving of these officers into the ghetto and the yelling in German uh, to get up, get dressed, uh, put warm clothes on, don't bring any suitcases, get out, get out, get out, faster. So this is interesting, right? So we see the camera in two different places, right? The camera is on the ground in the ghetto with the Nazis and they're making plans of where to start. You see the dogs barking, you know, the camera's kind of on the same level. And then you go back to the spectators. Again, you go back to Schindler um, um, and, and his wife watching from a hilltop, a hilltop on horses, you know, kind of distance. They're kind of bystanders. And this again, you know, goes back to something we talked a lot about in the class. You have perpetrators, you have victims, you have bystanders. Here are bystanders. Uh, he's not actually committing the violence. He's not a victim of the violence. He sees something in the film. Um, in reality, he learns of something. And the question is, what does it mean to see this? What does it mean to be a bystander at this moment? What does it mean to be uninvolved? It's a question we can ask ourselves, you know, as well. And here is a really interesting moment in the film as an establishing shot. Then the camera moves off their faces and we see what they're seeing, right? So again, think of the different kind of camera angles that are being used. We were down below in the ghetto as the Germans and the dogs, you know, began to unload out of their cars. We see the frenetic pace of the decision-making process, very calculated, very systematic. We'll start with ghetto B and then, you know, we'll move through. Then we go outside to the environment up on the hill and so, you know, this is a view, top, view from above, looking down into the ghetto, and we see what they're seeing. We see an event unfold before our eyes. He sees an event unfold before his eyes. In watching Schindler's List, we see an event unfold before our eyes. It's doubled, it's tripled in the film. She doesn't, that says they don't want to, doesn't want to watch. So then we move into a domestic space. Again, you know, obviously Schindler can't see inside, we can't see inside, and yet we're given access to an inside. A large part, I think, of the terror of this scene has to do with the violation of private space, the violation of personal space, the violation of families, the idea of a violent force coming in from the outside and moving inward. And what, Sch what Spielberg does, I think, you know, so brilliantly again, is create that effect of violation. And he moves constantly between the outside forces, right, the army, the SS officers, the dogs, you know, all these forces coming from the outside, and that these scenes of kind of quiet anxiety, horror, right, of children's faces up close in shadows and kind of light and darkness inside. And we put it together. You know, it doesn't take us, it's no, it, there's no cognitive leap of faith that has to happen. We realize that every single person inside, these innocent victims are about to be massively violated. 
And we also know that someone's watching from the outside, but not quite appreciating and understanding everything. And that's, of course, you know, Schindler. The camera lingers. It lingers. This is what I mentioned earlier, where they are about to consume the jewelry. So preparations, knowing what's happening. And you can hear, right? You hear. This is kind of, again, sort of non diegetic sound, but it makes sense because it's happening on the outside. You begin to have these very quick camera cuts. Uh, and this is also a technique that's very important in the film to create that effect of you know, violation. So you're cutting between you know, people running, the outside, people coming in. You're going back inside. But the sound is still there. right? The sound is continuous. The continuous sound also then helps us understand how this, this violation is, is happening. You know, this is like, put something warm on, come out. I'm going to fast forward just a tiny bit here, in the interest of time. particular scene that I wanted to go. So where I wanted to go is where, and where I'll end today is actually I think it's minute 108, where Schindler sees the little girl in red. I think it's right around here. I left this play for a second. So this is where I want to end today, but I want to, so he's been ostensibly watching from the hilltop the evacuation. And here, you know, as an emotional, you know, cue, the children's song in Yiddish, um, so it's a song of the victims. Um, we never see the choir singing, we never, you know, know who these children are, but a sound, um, the, a song sung by children, interrupted by gunfire, viewed by Schindler, and this is the moment of identification that he has with a victim, right? Where he recognizes that little girl in red, who in some ways is not just an individual, but also stands for, I'd say, you know, probably more broadly, all children, or, or innocence and victimization. And constantly, these shots and reverse shots, is like Schindler looking, then we see what he's looking at. And suddenly, this little figure emerges at the center here, right? She sees uh, as well. So, and it's amazing, right? She moves through the ghetto without being shot, without being harassed. It's almost like she's, she's lost of sorts and becomes an absolutely critical focal point for the film. So. I'm going to kind of conclude right now, but what I'd like you to do is watch the entire evacuation of the ghetto scene and try to then unpack some of the film techniques that create this, you know, this historical reality or this reality effect.
and I'll take up with the little red girl next time and some of the other techniques that Spielberg uses.